<laughs> All right, guys. Well, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that one up, but I think it's been a little low energy so far today. And so at the very, very least, I think it's important to uh, amp it up a little bit because we're at a very special event at a very special time in the not computing ecosystems history, right? It, Urbit used to be this small, tiny idea that was come up with by some crackpot, uh, you know, online bloggers, is that how we want to call it? But, but uh, at this point, there's an entire uh, world of people that have built their lives around this. And that's one of the most fun uh, framings of Urbit that I, that I think is worth coming in with. Uh, I think Anthony was one of the people that talked about this initially. But it, there's a beautiful moment when a project can not just be a hobby for a small group of people and not just be a speculative venture that, say, a small team of four or five are working on, but can be transformed into a game that a lot of people can play, that other people can come in and play with them, that uh, at a broad level can support them that they can build around, that people can build their lives around, that people can spend decades working on, that people can build families around. And so at the very least for this, uh, I think that this is a beautiful place to start in introducing what Zorp has been working on for a little over the past year. But before we quite get there, uh, I've been working on the Urbit project for the past five years, and it's been a beautiful thing to see the entire group of people come together and be able to transform and transition through the phases that this project has gone through from being just Talon working on it with a small team to growing substantially to uh, Talon itself transforming in mission to the Urbit Foundation becoming not an idea but a real thing that exists. And I, it would have been unimaginable to have this many people from this many disparate backgrounds interested in this uh, when I first started. So thank you all for coming, and uh, let's take it away and learn about what we've been doing for the past year. Our decisions are no longer our own. We are herded like cattle. But it is time for us to make a change. It's time for us to build. Societies of control direct our lives in subconscious ways, pulling us along with incentives and surveillance. The forces of soft power are growing more powerful, gripping, constricting, suffocating. More than ever, we need a way out. We dream of a future, a neutral ground, a blank canvas upon which to paint our lives. This future was just a dream until man created Knox. In the beginning, Nock was minimal and beautiful, but not impactful. Urbit developers created immensely powerful technology with sparse resources, but the work is not done. Most other projects sold out to Faustian bargains, and they are paying for it. Existing tools are not enough. Glory beckons to us. Take responsibility. Build a meaningful legacy. There is no need to fear or hope, only to look for new weapons. Yeah. I'm very excited to say that the not computing ecosystem has grown now. The not computing ecosystem doesn't only consist of this singular Urbit model of this solid state interpreter meant for personal computing, but rather the not computing ecosystem now contains not chain. And I'm pleased to say that we are building not chain as a blank slate ZK L1. So in the same way that Urbit sought to be a blank slate computing ecosystem for personal computing, 
we are building Knockchain as a blank slate, ZK-enabled L1, the first of its kind in many ways. And I'm excited to tell you all about it because not only is it unique in far, insofar as it's targeting the Urbit and the not computing ecosystem, but we are doing a lot of things that have never been done before. And it's amusing because there's a strong tendency in the crypto community to approach everything from a standpoint of cynicism. And it's understandable because everyone that's talking to you is always financially motivated. But there's room for sincerity. There's room for things that can be built by people that care to build civilization-grade infrastructure that can last. This is the ethos that Urbit comes to computing with, and we're bringing this ethos to the blockchain ecosystem. We're in a unique place to do so, on the one hand, because, well, most of us just haven't really cared that much about crypto. It's not to say we haven't cared about permissionless financial infrastructure, but rather, most of us haven't, say, been caught up in the various Ponzi's and the various schemes, and it's exciting for us to then be able to approach the problem of building a blockchain, the problem of uh, providing global consensus infrastructure to the Urbit network and more broadly from a blank slate. So we've built over the past year a ZKVM, a unique ZKVM. Some of you know about this already, but it uses the NOC model to achieve performance traits that just haven't been seen before that enable new use cases. But not only this, by being built around the NOC computing model, it brings ZK to general purpose computing in a way that few other projects are even thinking about, but certainly that no one else has been able to achieve at the level of scale that NOC is going to be able to be achieving. So if we kind of take a step back and think about what does it mean to have something like a ZK proof? It means that you can take computation and make it verifiable. That you can ask your computer to do something, and when it comes back and says, oh, here's what I did, you can know for certain if it's the thing that you asked it to do. Not only this, but it can provide privacy. It can provide information hiding. This is essential for various uh, very important use cases. But not only this, it can compress massive, massive computations and the fact that they were done into tiny, tiny pieces of information, which can provide scaling traits that just haven't been able to be achieved before. All right, let's move forward. So uh, our, our wonderful, wonderful uh, chief of research, Sam Parker, who was formerly working with some other very high profile uh, blockchain projects, uh, honestly, one of the most exciting people I've been able to work with over the, over the past year, um, has joined us and has built an incredibly novel transaction model, which I'm excited to share with all of you. So this right here is one of the three ingredients that makes NotChain special. And not just special, but unique among its kind. Not, not just a small iterative step forward, but rather a step change. It's our contention that no one has been able to build a ZK blockchain before. It's amusing, but we truly believe this. And often people will point at this example or that example and say, oh, well, you know, people are not using that or people are, you know, that works, it's running. Well, does it work? Is it running? Do people <laughs> use it? <laughs> this, this is my question to you. Uh, show me someone using it for anything. Show me, some, show me something running that anyone can make use of for any meaningful purpose. A ZK blockchain, a blockchain that it makes use of ZK to provide any of the things that ZK proofs are good at, has not been achieved, period. It's not due to lack of trying, but rather it's due to you know, various contingent factors. Technology not being here at this place in time, people making this technical commitment at this time, etc. But we're excited to say that we've brought a new transaction model to the ZK space that has a variety of innovations that can provide many of the most important traits that ZK proofs can bring to bear in general computing, but fully unleashed in a blockchain setting. So let's think about this for a moment. Airwalk is the first blockchain transaction model that fully harnesses the power of ZKPs. It provides privacy, unlinkable transactions with hidden content. This means 
that the actual programs that you're running may be private. It means that the content of the programs may be private in terms of the data that they're interacting with. It means that the amounts of the transactions that are moving around, where they are moving to, who they are moving to, may be private. It means that we're using ZK proofs for scalability. We're providing multiple forms of scalability, in fact, with ZK proofs. And these, these form factors have never been combined in any setting before. Actually, they haven't been attempted to be combined. This is not the same thing as my prior contention, which was that people have tried and it just hasn't worked. No one has actually tried to combine these traits in one place before. This is entirely novel. So for scalability, computation occurs fully off-chain with constant on-chain verification. What this means in practice is not just that ah, yeah, well, on-chain computation is slow, and so we have to you know, pay high amounts of gas and have this occur, then that occur, then that occur. No, you do computation on your computer, you do computation on your phone, you ask the computation to be done by miners, whichever one it is, and it occurs off-chain. And the only thing that occurs on-chain is that it's verified. This is a beautiful thing because verification is cheap. Verification is, you know, 50 milliseconds, regardless of the computation size. This is not something that has been achieved in broad practice by any means, by any blockchain, period. It's an amusing thing to say because in the blockchain world, everyone's used to people over-promising and under-delivering. And at the very least, I want us to fast forward to six months and I want to see, I want us to all kind of just mark these things I'm saying for six months from now. Mark these things that I'm saying for a year from now. And we'll see. Whether, whether these promises I'm giving actually live up to, to what I'm saying. But at the very least, listen to us, continue to keep your grain of salt, and let's keep going. Okay, so the other thing that we provide is state minimization. So this means that full nodes only require a constant size proof and active state. Notably, I'm not saying that we, that we only need a proof for you to verify the entire chain state, but I am saying that you only need the constant size proof and the active chain state. This means you don't need to store the entire history, and further, you can perform state compression on that active state such that more or less it's entirely feasible to be running a full node on your phone. This doesn't just unlock rinky-dinky use cases like node in a box at home, which I love node in a box, it's wonderful, but it's been tried a lot of times, at the very least in the blockchain setting, and for sole blockchain full nodes, it's not a strong use case. But if you can run a full node on your phone, that means that you can host client interfaces on your phone. That means that if you want an application that interacts with that node, that you don't necessarily need to depend on an Etherscan or a block explorer that's hosted elsewhere in order to go get data. You can query it on demand and go have that be a component of your browsing experience. You could be browsing the state on chain in a way that you haven't been able to do in the past. I'm talking about an entirely new internet, which I'm sure you've thought about before in the Urbit context, and Urbit is a beautiful approach. I love Urbit. Obviously, I'm an Urbit maximalist. But there's multiple components to an internet. One of them, obviously, is the castle interior, the place where you're safe at home with all of your data and computation. And the other one is the public commons. We provide, for the first time, a public commons for not computation, where you can actually link your Urbit to something that's happening that's outside of it, that's outside of it in a way that's meaningful, that's global consensus, that's fully compatible with your Urbit. Full knock over the wire, nouns from your Urbit to the chain, back to your Urbit. Doing computation that's involved with on-chain consensus, but doesn't have to be executed on-chain. Let's keep going. All right, so for developers, you can run knock computations of unbounded size. This means you can run very, very large computations, yes? and you can have them be proven and checked into chain without worrying about you know, paying insane fees for this. If, you, if you're doing tons and tons of proofs, go buy a node, go buy some hardware, run proofs on your machine, check them in on chain. This is, this is a sustainable model. We're not talking about some scarce resource that has to be you know, like, uh, dribbled out just to the highest value use cases like we see in Etherscan with Uniswap. We're talking about use the compute you need, check it in on chain, don't worry about it. Next, we can process transaction with unprecedented parallelism. This means that not only can we be building these proofs up totally offline, but rather it also means that we can get insane throughput. We're not talking about, oh, yes, well, you know, the chain has to be money, so it can only do so much. Ah, uh, yes, well, uh, it just needs to transfer value, and we don't expect that it can have users, so uh, 
I suppose we're just reinventing gold. No, no, no. We're talking about having our cake and eating it too. And this isn't something that's been possible before because ZK proofs haven't been effectively operationalized before. Okay? Aside from this, we're talking about something else that's beautiful that may not even be able to be like fully grasped at this stage. But smart contract scope is all active chain state. If you have a smart contract, your smart contract doesn't operate just over the data in the transaction. It operates over anything that's on chain at that time. OK? You can be linking in and querying and interacting with data, reading in data, kind of as akin to how you might, for instance, analogously, via remote scry. You can be statelessly reading in data from the entire rest of the chain as a part of your computation. OK. This type of power, uh, Sam likes to say, of course, he says that the heuristic that we've gone with for building this chain's transaction model is to give an irresponsible level of power to our developers. Well, guys, this is because we believe in you. We think that you can do beautiful, beautiful things. Build insane, crazy Lisp machines, weird alternative versions of Quines. We think that you can build nuts things that have never been seen before with the power that Knock gives you. We think that you can take your computation occurring on Urban OS and run it directly on chain. We think that you can build up toys and let those interact with other toys and compose into weird functions that, you know, I don't even know what you're going to do with it. I, we can talk offline about a ton of use cases that I think are going to be enabled by this concretely. But for now, blank slate. Just imagine. OK, here's another important ingredient here. The second ingredient. The first was the airwalk transaction model. The second is our consensus schema. Proof of recursive proof. You might ask, well, if you just have this new transaction model and you just have this new compute engine, why not just do an L2 on Ethereum? Yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the hip thing to do right now. Why solve consensus? Consensus is a hard problem. Why would you want to solve it if you don't have to? Well, consensus is a hard problem, but it's also a very, very important problem. And as I mentioned, we're a blank slate not chain, right? Well. Proof of recursive proof is a beautiful model that utilizes what we've learned about proof of work. Proof of work is the most powerful way to incentivize computation on some form of a computation platform, to incentivize optimization of that compute target, to incentivize capacity of that compute platform, and to build up a decentralized, isn't it funny how our words stop meaning things when they start being turned into marketing terms? Oh, man. Uh, to, but to build up a decentralized ecosystem of computers that are actually competing to perform this computation the best at the highest scale. OK. So proof of recursive proof is a proof of useful work schema. The first person to come up with the idea of doing a proof of useful work schema in a, uh, in a realized context, in, in a uh, not theoretically impossible context was is sitting right here in the audience, Aki Kadas. And uh, I am pleased to say that we've uh, had a lot of uh, strong intellectual influences here, uh, even aside from just our good old uh, friend, Uncle Yarv. But uh, beautifully enough, beautifully enough, proof of useful work in our context is proof of recursive proof, where the work that you're doing to secure the blockchain is also the work that you're needing to do to scale the blockchain. You're building transactions. You're building proofs, zero-knowledge proofs, of transactions, of the computations that are part of those transactions, as a way of searching for the next block. What does this mean? It means that everyone's competing not just to do SHA hashes. We love SHA. Nothing wrong with it, right? But rather to do something a little more useful, general proofs of computation, any computation, specifically not computation. All right, proof of recursive proof, or PORP, right? We got our nice little dolphin, porpoise, right? OK, so uh, we are bootstrapping the capacity for our ZK compute platform with proof of work, the absolute best way to bootstrap a new compute platform, right? How much has Bitcoin gone up in the past uh, uh, you know, 15 years? And I'm not talking about the price. How much has it gone up in terms of its compute capacity, right? 
Uh, Sam says 10 to the 18 sometimes. I don't know if that's true. That's insanely large, but let's see. All right, so miners do entirely useful work. They're proving arbitrary not compute. We went through this. The, and the transaction throughput scales as a function of the proof rate. That's a little silly, right? Because if we saw that exact same dynamic that we're talking about in terms of, wow, like there's a ton of compute happening now, more and more and more. This competition is encouraging optimization of this essential function of the chain. This block reward is subsidizing computation that needs to occur for users, for developers, for not based companies. Well, if we can do that again, just like Bitcoin did with SHA, we're going to be living in an entirely different world because Every company, or as I like to say, a research project, I think there's very few actual companies in ZK, uh, every ZK research project likes to say, we're moving towards a ZK internet, an internet where you can verify what you, what's being done around you, an internet that is more trustworthy, an internet that's not just a soup of malicious actors. And I believe that too, which is why we're building on Urbit and why we're building on NOC, general purpose computation, scaled up, on a new global consensus layer. All right, let's keep going. So, and here we get to knock. Obviously, we're Herbert maximalists, but why knock, right? Why, why use this uh, crazy, crazy 12 instruction thing that can't run an instructions efficiently without jets, right? Why do that? Because knock is the perfect VM for blockchain, general compute for ZK. It's the perfect function for everything. So. In our, in our very opinionated, very opinionated uh, world, we were able to discover that we could build a more efficient ZKVM, right? It's like build a better mousetrap, more or less. Uh, build a better ZKVM, a better ZKVM model, not just the back end, not just the crazy math stuff the researchers talk about, a better way of thinking about the compute and turning it into these crazy mathematic polynomials, right? We've got some crazy mathematicians in our team. They're here. Go talk to them about the math. That's not me. Um, but we figured out that we were able to turn the knock abstraction into not only a beautiful and minimal, but into a more efficient ZKVM architecture. OK, not only that, but all of you are geniuses. And I want all of you to be making lots of money and having a lot of kids. <laughs> and so I'm here to give you guys, and women, all of you, we need both, right? Uh, I'm here to give all of you a way to utilize not for that purpose, which is, we are finally bringing Web3 business models to Urban. Go build financialized protocols that talk to Knock. Have them talk to Urban. Have them interact with your personal compute. But make some money. This is the way to do it. So we've done this by beating these research projects at their own game and building a company around it. All right, so we've liberated ZKVMs from the inefficient von Neumann style. If some of you were in Wyoming at Jay's wonderful conference a few months ago, you've already seen this slide, but it's just as beautiful now as it was then. Uh, so we have built Eden, which uh, we're trying to return there, as you can imagine. But we have built Eden, the efficient decoding of NOC. And uh, this, this uh, beautiful acronym and most of the ideas in it are by Brian Platt right there in the audience. But, uh, this beautiful model for turning not computation into polynomials that can be proven in provable statements utilizes an incredible cross-platform across proving systems uh, way of thinking about computation. And we're giving you all of that power and hooking it up to a chain because we love you. <sighs> We're also making not computing more accessible with Acacia, a new general purpose language. Acacia is a code name. Don't, don't hold me to it. And uh, I love Hoon personally. You know, I'm, I'm real into it. But if, you, if that's not your thing, that's OK. We see this function on your left, very terse, all, all these nice things, right? This is Hoon for, I think, summing up a list, yeah. On the right, we have Acacia, a Swift-based scripting language that you could think of as the closure for whom? 
It builds on the same standard library. We're probably going to rename a lot of the standard library names. We're not going to be welding and scagging and slopping and all the things you're used to. We're going to be concatenating, right? We're going to be appending. Um, but both of these are going to, obviously, Hoon is compatible with our ZKVM. Obviously, Hoon is compatible with Urbit and with Nockchain. But so is Acacia. Acacia is not specific to Nockchain. It's also not specific to our ZKVM. It is a general purpose scripting language that we are building for the purpose of making developer onboarding easier. Because while all of you have the alpha and can go build wonderful financialized protocols, we don't just want to build for the cult. We want to, we want to introduce more people to our cult, to our beautiful world of not computing. And Acacia is how we're going to do it. Neil Davis is an amazing teacher, but we need something easier to learn because we just got to shift the bell curve a little bit, guys. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's our demo. Um, we're probably going to be posting more demos that are more featureful, because as you can imagine, you can only fit so many things into short periods of time. But this is our demo of a small little, I guess we'd call it a fake net, running our Z, uh, it's not running our ZKVM, but it is running our notchain kernel. It is running our notchain node architecture. And it is uh, connecting and all of that stuff. Terminal output's going to be a little messy, but over here, we're basically running a monarch. We're basically faking out the consensus process in this example. But we're running a Rust notchain node that doesn't use the VR code base. I will say it does depend on Edward's Ares. We're, we're uh, extremely incentivized for Ares, and it starts, publishing on these, it starts publishing block headers on a topic. We're booting up some peasants that are just connecting to the leader, right? And look at that. They're getting, they're getting events over, over the peer-to-peer -peer network from the leader that's pushing out blocks. They're hearing new blocks, and they are poking them into their notchain kernel. They are persisting them. They are doing the appropriate computation to put those in there. And look at that. We have a peer-to-peer -peer network sitting here that's running on a different solid-state interpreter that's running on a different NOT kernel that is not running on Arvo, that is not running on Urbit, that is not running on Veer, that does not have any C code in it. That is a NOT chain. This is the second solid-state interpreter to ever be built for a practical use case. The first was obviously Urbit. And what do you know? Um, we are going to be uh, launching this early in 2024. We will be doing limited developer previews before this. Obviously, as you can imagine, it's going to be transforming very rapidly um, because our wonderful team is going to be working on it. But for now, pretty colors on the terminal screen. We like that, don't we? All right. Well, I'm happy to take questions. Happy to take questions. That's most of what we've got here for today. Get in that microphone. It's going to be great. Uh, what's the fee structure for transactions going to look like? Yeah, so you can imagine that you can, that with the proof of recursive proof schema, that you can go submit a computation to be proven to the miners and that they'll prove it for you, right? And you'll be paying them based on the size of that computation, right? Then on the other end, you can submit a proof, pay less. See, so okay, you, you you can supply your own proof. Yes. And then, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Lovely. Got a few more. If uh, say like I create a proof offline and submit it to the chain, but uh, the state has changed by then, uh, does that like get rejected or how does it work? No. So this is, this is beautiful because you're actually zeroing in on one of the reasons why other chains don't work. And I love that. Wonderful, wonderful question. So this, there's a race condition in some of the operationalized ZK chains that do exist in which basically when you submit your proof, if you've submitted it on a prior block header, right, then what do you know? You have to go make a whole new proof. Okay, so you can actually split up the computation you're doing such that you make a proof, and then you have a smaller proof that you need to make that is linked to the block header such that you avoid this race condition. So the computation you're going to be submitting is not going to be actually containing that block header. It's actually going to be a proof of a recursive covenant that's a part of your transaction. 
because we're in a UTXO model. And so while you have fully operational smart contracts, and I, and, uh, I think we're going to be hosting a talk from Sam on Monday at our villa. So please, please come on that. I'm, I'm going to see, I'm going to see about uh, open interest on that. But basically, we'll be diving in more on the transaction model. But basically, we're doing recursive covenants on top of uh, a UTXO model. I see. Thanks. Yes. Looks like we've done more. Hey, uh, yeah, you talked about kind of like the discoverability of sort of all of this state, right? Like how exactly is that working, right? Like how is all of the state of all of these different contracts working? Obviously kind of like given like the UTXO model, mm -hmm. like what are you doing about like data availability and kind of? That? Yeah, another great question. So there's a, few, there's a few things at work here. So on the one hand, when you're actually uh, building something like this, building a global consensus chain, data availability is a chief concern. I will say that in a proof of stake context, data availability is a significantly harder problem to solve that has significantly worse um, primitives that you have to work with than in a proof of work model. So I'll, I'll tell you precisely why. So, the incentives when you're doing data availability and proof of work are more or less that it's strongly in the incentives of the, of the block publisher to make the data for the transaction available to the other peers. Because if they don't, their transaction could be rejected. And in practice, we don't really see data availability problems in proof of work systems, whereas we do at times in proof of stake. That being said, data availability, while it's a very trendy thing with Celestia and all of this, often is, a, is, except for kind of a few uh, contexts like MENA, uh, data availability is broadly not as large of a problem as many VCs make it out to be. That being said, we have uh, a lot of interesting thoughts around basically incentivizing data availability, which Sam can actually uh, pound you over the head with offline. I mean, this, this guy, I mean, he, he's been talking to me about it for weeks. Um, so he'll be the one to talk to in terms of like you know very specific gadgets around basically um, ensuring block block validity is actually contingent upon that block being available as well. But in terms of for smart contract use cases, um, UTXOs are for many people notor notoriously difficult to build with. In large part, I think they get this bad reputation because they're used to trying to build things in Bitcoin script. Right, which is kind of scary, right? So we're just doing normal Hoon computation, which everyone here is used to. But on the other end of that, we also have a namespace on Notchain. Notchain is not just a compute ecosystem. It's a namespace and register storage ecosystem. And so in that sense, you can imagine a little bit similar to ENS, right? You could have your contract have a name, right? You could say, oh, my, my, my uh, UTXO, it's named Uniswap. And as, and as the state in that UTXO transitions, right, it's still named Uniswap. And so from other transactions, they can just say in their logic, oh, go call out to Uniswap. Go, go do something that's based on that state. This is a primitive very familiar to account model developers. And we're uh, able to provide that primitive in addition to the benefits that UTXOs provide. Hope that's helpful. Sometimes we have so many features that I don't even know how to include them all in the talk. It's kind of crazy. So in your talk, you described proof of um, useful work. So I'm I think a lot of us here are really familiar with Nakamoto consensus and what it means to find a block, you know, this magic number that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to find a block in Nakchain? Yeah, absolutely. So I can give you the broad strokes, and the man sitting right next to you has written the papers and done the work for the past eight years, I think, of his life around perfecting this precise model. So uh, I'm going to give the broad strokes. Forgive me. <laughs> so more or less, you can imagine that you're building a proof of a recursive proof. Right? So there's, you can imagine there being a block diff, a proof of some block diff to the chain occurring. You take the hash of that proof, and if it has the appropriate number of leading zeros, then you've found the block. And so you could think of it as, at worst case, the security falls back to Nakamoto consensus. In fact, for many of our um, parameters, like things like block time and difficulty retargeting, we're, we're basically just learning from the best. Do we have any more? People are shy. That's OK. Oh, we do have another. We do.
thanks for coming, everybody, and you know, staying the whole time. It's really hard to sit in one place. My, my kid, he knows. Could you explain what, what do you see are the benefits of UTXO over account-based systems? Yeah, yeah, there's so many, it's hard to even list. Okay, so first off, ZK proofs hate account models, but also blockchains hate account models. VCs, they love account models. Um, not all of them. Some of them are actually very smart. Um, but, but uh, okay, so let's, let's get into it a little bit. So account models got really hot when Ethereum came out, right? That everyone was like, whoa, Ethereum's like doing great, right? So accounts must be the best, right? Okay, so the uh, global computer in an account-based model is basically uh, a sequential, single-threaded processor that's supposed to fit everything everybody cares to do through one single-lane highway. Do this, then do that, then do that, because it's based on stateful mutations, and any single contract could affect, or any single transaction may be statefully affecting many, many different things, and you don't know everything it's going to be affecting in terms of state before you run it. And so in practice, the best way anyone has ever been able to uh, build out parallelism in an account model is by more or less building out optimistic things where they just run everything at the same time, and then they just kind of if there's any conflicts, they discard one of the conflicts kind of a, as a heuristic, often whichever one paid me less, right? And then they just keep doing that over and over again. But it's actually incredibly difficult to reconcile these things, and it's incredibly difficult to introduce parallelism, hack it in, in this account-based model when it's not meant for that, right? You're not, you're not meant to have the entire world's global compute go through a single-lane highway. It's, it's actually just a bad idea. Um, and so the, the UTXO-based model is entirely meant for global compute. You have each individual transaction, and it may only mutate its, the inputs into the transaction. Ah, I put this UTXO, that UTXO, and that one into this transaction. The dependencies, the data dependencies, are explicitly tracked in the system. So you can run everything in parallel. You can just do it. And especially in a ZK model, but particularly if you care at all about privacy, it is uh, orders of magnitude more difficult to do this in an account-based model than it is in a UTXO-based model. And so uh, at some point, you know, if you've been hitting yourself in the hammer for a few years, you kind of wonder, why, why am I doing this, right? Why, why, you know, I don't really want to be doing this, so why am I still doing it, right? And so we're building with UTXOs because they're better in every possible way. Hey, Logan. Um, what are the resource requirements for being a miner? How does one, sorry, it's a series of related questions, but I promise they're related. So what are the resource requirements for being a miner? How does one become a miner? How long do the proofs take to generate? And then what impact does that have on finality? Like, how does finality work? Great questions. OK, so how does one become a miner? One starts running the Notchain software with the mining flag on. It's totally permissionless to become a miner. Yep. Permissionless validator set. Oh, I forgot to even mention one of the most important things. We're doing a fair launch, guys. We don't have a pre-mine. I don't know if anybody cares. OK, yeah, so fair launch, pre-mine. Um, you know, uh, this one weird trick that VCs hate. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway. Trust me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so we're doing fair launch, and uh, so anyone can mine. Anyone can mine from you know day one of the uh, network. Um, it's not fortuitous to talk too specifically about your launch date, but uh, we're uh, picking a funny day. So uh, you know, if we get closer, and we're definitely going to hit it, uh, you may laugh. Um, but but uh, anyway, so beyond that, um, in terms of resource requirements, uh, we expect you'll want a GPU. We expect you'll want to have integrated memory with that GPU. We don't expect that GPU will need to have that much memory, but we do expect you'll want it to be integrated. Is that helpful, at least? Awesome, yeah. Um, and just if you can speak to how yeah, long yeah. it takes to generate the proofs or the, the finality aspect, or maybe you haven't Yeah, yeah, these are two separate questions. OK, yeah, yeah, OK. So first off, in terms of how long it takes to generate the proofs, I can give you a lovely estimate. Um, and and I, hope you're, I hope you'll forgive me for that, because as you can imagine, while we do have a complete ZKVM, we don't have a fully optimized ZKVM, much less one that is 
running the entire transaction model that Sam has been uh, so faithful to uh, bequeath to us. So we've been very, very pleased that he's been giving us this beautiful thing, but we don't actually have that running in our proving system yet, you know, whole cloth. So my expectation is that proofs of large, meaningful computation will take somewhere in the realm of two to 10 seconds. My expectation, it, once that large, meaningful computation is also doing all of Sam's fancy stuff, is that it may be a little higher. Maybe better, we'll see. Um, that being said, in terms of finality, uh, this is something that a lot of people have really, really thought a lot about in terms of, you know, how can I have a transaction that's occurring, you know, I want to check out at a coffee shop or something like that. Wow, I'm not going to wait here for an hour while they, you know, duct, ma duct tape me to a chair so I don't leave, you know, it's like, you know, this is not fun, right? Uh, on the one hand, proof of work basically, at the very least, is a well-trodden path in terms of understanding uh, block reorgs, particularly once you can factor in, I think he's quantized like uh, the likelihood of orphan rate based on proving time or something like this. I think he's got a formula, he'll tell you the formula. Um, but on the other hand, um, you can also introduce uh, funky little finality jet finality gadgets like we saw with Casper, and uh, it's likely that not in the first version, but probably uh, a proposed additional version, uh, that, that we'll introduce something similar. Wow, you guys are keeping them coming. I love the energy. This is great. Actually, Phil, oh, we got someone that hasn't gone before, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't hate you. I don't hate you. You had good questions before. <sighs> So, speaking like Amina and how they designed everything, mm -hmm. um, are we going to be able to run like ZK state channels? ZK state channels, yes. The answer is yes. Sam is nodding okay. very aggressively. Um, so, you can honestly uh, think of your UTXO broadly as being a ZK state channel, or, being, uh, or frankly, as being its own app chain for arbitrarily complicated apps which you can be proving, again, offline, even through multiple state transitions if you want to. You might do, you know, you might be playing Pokemon, you walk through the grass a thousand times, battle your Pokemon, and then, what do you know, you check in your proof once you've actually, like, you know, beat a monster or something like that. You don't have to, you know, check in every single step or something like that. It all depends on how you write your program, but, I mean, we're genuinely trying to be just, you know, ridiculous in terms of what we let you do. Oh, beautiful. Good. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think we're just about done. I can. I. He's still got it. So let's 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 do it. Let's do it. I think that. I think after that we'll be done. Thanks for the questions. These have been great stuff, guys. Thank you for giving me another chance. So you mentioned that uh, the miner would pro make proofs, and there's some difficulty factor requiring the hash of the proof to have a certain number of zeros. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So does that mean some of the proofs, some of the useful computation gets thrown out the window? No. So this, this is a very key point. So you're basically uh, recursively including additional transactions. And so at any point, if any proof of the block diff has the appropriate number of leading zeros, then all of the transactions that have been included into the block diff proof are, are then submitted on chain. You're, you know, it, in the system that you're kind of like worried that we might be stupid enough to implement, um, which you know it, you know it's a hard, it's a hard thing. I mean, you know, this guy spent the last eight years on it. Um, but in that in that particular system, you would only then be able to say include like say one transaction per block, which would be unfeasible, right? Okay, that's beautiful. Good. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, everyone.